Welcome to episode 67 of Silver Lining for Learning. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside, as Emerson Eichen Palmer once said. You know, every day is a special day, but it's ex this day, this day is extremely special because we get to meet my good friend, Jilly Salmon, who has been a leader, a, a motivator, a prominent figure in the field of e-learning and blended learning and the future of education. She's been a thought leader. And she's someone who's gonna share those thoughts with us today, including including what it's gonna be like, possibly post pandemic. I met Jilly Salmon in New Zealand at dinner in 2002 in April when we were deciding whether to have crocodile or snake or something else. I'm not sure what she picked that night, but I did not pick the snake. Uh, <laughs> Jilly is known for her books called E-Moderating and e -tivities. And those books are so popular that when I went down to look on my bookshelf, they are not there because my students have stole them. So I cannot share those books with you all. But do take a look. E-Moderating e book has a, has a, a model, a five-stage model of online learning that she walks you through getting you to really move towards a highly interactive and socially constructivistic framework. And she'll talk a bit about that today and some of her other work in Carpe Diem and uh, you know, what she's currently working on today. Now, Julie, could you reflect back for us? Because I know that you had a prominent role in the Open U in the UK, where Michael Sharples, our guest from last, well, two weeks ago was, you were there before him. Mm -hmm. I happened to be there a year and a half ago for their 50 year anniversary celebration. Uh, that's a special place. Not only that, because I think you got two of your degrees from there. Could you walk us through a little bit of your history going, thinking back and what openness means and the open university means and then we'll talk about Leicester and Australia and other things. So um, you want to take it away? Sure. Well, let me tell you about the Open University. I mean, it was um, a great vision of a politician, as you say, started 50 years ago. And, and at the time, people said, oh, it'll never work. And its vision of openness was not really the one we have now. It was that you didn't need any qualifications for entry. And therefore, they had to teach super well in students first years and also that it was not ever going to have any campuses so people think that during the pandemic that was a sort of shocking thing to happen but the OU has never had a campus well it has a campus with the academics in it but no students um, but for me it was life-changing um, to cut a long story short I was not uh, born with any silver spoon and you know, nobody in my family had gone to university or even considered it necessary. Um, and I did what a lot of sort of lower working class girls did is got married and produced four children quite quickly. And so it was quite a lot later um, that I started my OU degree and found that it was absolutely for me um, and quite quickly got a first class honours in psychology and technology, my first degree. Um, and then um, went on actually elsewhere um, to, to do a master's degree and then went back to the OU quite a bit later to do my PhD, which was where the five stage model came from. That was sort of at that point. So I, I'm happy to say um, ultimately I became a member of staff, a lecturer, worked my way up all the way through. But without that, I'm sure I would still be stacking shelves. Absolutely certain of it, you know. So yeah. I, I think it's just, you know, the most innovative university of the 20th century. Um, and long before any, anybody had really thought about distance learning as real, um, they were doing it on a massive scale. And, and I'm a product of it. You know, three years later, after seeing you in, in um, Hamilton, uh, New Zealand, I met you again in Leicester when you were the head of the Beyond Distance Research Alliance and what was called the Media Zoo. 
why did you call it the media zoo and why did you take the jump from the open U to go to Leicester? Uh, uh, well, I could easily still be working for the Open University and it, it remains in my heart. However, um, I realized it was good to, you know, at that point to get other forms of experience really um, in, you know, more regular universities. And I was just offered the opportunity to share my knowledge across a whole university. Uh, quite a traditional university, um, science and medicine mainly, um, to see how much we could do to actually transform the way teaching was happening on a campus of that kind. Had an absolutely great time there. You'll remember when you visited, it's a very multicultural university and a fabulous place to sort of live and work and learn about the world. Um, anyway, why did I call it the Media Zoo? I think it was something about taming wild technologies, um, putting them up for educational purposes, um, realizing there were some very wild technologies that people weren't doing a lot with. And it was, you know, there were also well, quite newer technologies that you, you could use that were starting to become more commonplace and you could make a pet of them so that was my metaphor, but it kind of worked. And I don't know whether you remember, but we actually decorated a whole room like a zoo and we got ourselves I into the metaphor. Remember. <laughs> we got our... I do um, remember. I think you dressed, some people dressed up and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and I don't know, it served us well for quite a long time. Um, and I, I, I was very well supported by the senior management and I also was very successful in getting research. So I always since then have tried to give a, a, an intriguing label to everything I do. Well, you alluded to your metaphor. Uh, you're the <laughs> metaphor person. We're, we'll get into some of those metaphors later on. I think Young has a question for you and then Chris is gonna jump in. Young? So um, I was just gonna, uh, curious because Julie, you've been uh, University leader, you know, uh, that's uh, so I was just wondering about higher education, because right now, you know, um, the pandemic has forced many higher education institutions, not many, almost virtually everybody to offer online. Mm -hmm. uh, but that online is different from the real truly online. It's, it's <laughs> just uh, people just rush to do whatever they were doing, you know, get on Zoom, get on Google Hangout and whatever they were doing. So but um, however, you know, the you have a lot of international students scattered around the globe and even many local students do not come. I was just wondering, where do you see the trend? Do you think, think do you see the formation of possibly new global institutions actually have deliberately to serve a globally distributed population of students? Because right now there's no global institution. If they come to Swinburne, Western Australia or Melbourne, mm that's what they have, right? Mm -hmm. So because they were offering something that's culturally based, you, you go to a place, you go to Harvard, you study at Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, but, so do you see anything happening at all? You know, taking this well, idea- Well, it's time you and I started one, isn't it really? That you, you know, it's about, about time that we had to go at this, but I think um, there, there are people who have tried, you know, they've tried um, to think differently. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this would be true transformation. I, I think there's probably four things that are going to happen for all of those universities worldwide, your own and many others. Um, I'm visiting professor at four now. Um, and um, essentially, there are a few who just want to go back to where they were. So they'll go back to their location based teaching. Um, um, and maybe they're usually ones that are terrified about their reputation, aren't they, really? Um, and then there's others who are going to do some adaption. And there's a sort of this strange thing called blended learning that they think that's going to solve it. Um, there's others who are evolving, but, you know, and, and looking to survive to become fitter for the new futures. But what you're talking about is a real transformation, isn't it? It's really doing things completely differently um, and exploiting the technology differently. And it's in a quadrant that's, you know, high risk, but over the horizon for me. 
Um, is anybody going to succeed? I jolly well hope so. Um, um, but I haven't yet seen anyone who's actually got all the characteristics that would make for a success because you need to trial it, you need to try and fail like any sort of radical innovation many times. Well, because I was also thinking about, uh, you know, open university supposed to be serving students wherever they are. Uh, I was really considering about uh, now you have so many students who do not have access to higher education. Of course, we have had MOOCs in you know, trying to serve others, but I was just wondering to say, can we or should we try to build global institutions to offer very low cost higher education to different countries, different places, and also to kind of denationalize the idea mm. about, you know, mm. how uh, education, you know, have to travel across national borders. So that was just, uh, you know, just happy to hear your comment. Yeah, so, I mean, I think obviously your vision is, is brilliant and perfect. Um, the reality is that a very high quality student-centered successful um, online learning is not low cost. Um, so you've got a bit of an oxymoron on that. To do it well, you do it differently. You design before the students come in and then you train the tutors so they have presence. Um, and that's really why the MOOCs have not turned into that, you know, that the costs are high. So it, we would need some real investment of, oh, of the kind the Open University probably got back in, the, in 1970 in the UK but it would have to be on a global scale. And, and at the moment, I think the diversion is elsewhere. So yes, we should. Can we? Needs work. All right, Chris, <laughs> I think you have a question. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. I wanna build on, on what both of you have been saying and uh, generally go back to something that, that you said in, when we were talking in the pre-show about to, to look forward, you have to begin by looking back. So I think about when I was an undergraduate a long time ago and how many of the assumptions that higher education had then, it still has. So there was an assumption that education is a scarce good. And uh, so you need a, a small fraction of people in society need you know, sophisticated higher education, and then they, they're they sufficient to, to run everything and, and make the world work, kind of like uh, Brave New Worlds, Aldous Huxley's vision. Uh, there was an assumption that uh, grades and test scores predict not just success in, in education, which they tend to do, but that they predict success in life. And of course, we know that the correlation between test scores and success in life and grades and success in life, other than the fact that, that you get a boost from having a degree, uh, is not very high, not very high at all. And I think that what we face now, and, and both of you have been saying this in different ways, is far from being a scarce good, everybody needs, globally, needs the equivalent of a higher education, not, not necessarily for work, but certainly for citizenship, because we've got you know, the power now to, to trash the world. And if we're democratic, then uh, everybody has to be intelligent enough to make good choices. We also, um, are, are facing uh, the fact that um, people, if we want to educate everybody to be successful in life, it isn't one size fits all. As you said, the professors had to work really hard when there were open admissions, not because people couldn't succeed, but because they couldn't succeed with a single form of teaching. And so what technology has given us is the opportunity to have an ecosystem of education in which people can find the niche that works for them. And if you're doing it at scale, you can find a bunch of other people in the same niche that works for them 
So you're personalizing, but you're not, you're not isolating. And, and that model, if we can get to it, seems to be, you know, sort of what the new set of assumptions should be, that somebody coming in as an undergraduate 10 years from now, maybe that's the new set of assumptions. Education is not a scarce good, it's an essential for everyone. Um, admission should be open because it's essential for everyone, but then you have to have a very rich ecosystem of instructional styles to reach everyone and so on and so on. And I, I think I, this, there, there's, I think there's a question in here somewhere as I keep talking. I'll see if I can <laughs> find a question as opposed to giving well, a sermon. While you, while you think about that, let me tell you a little bit about what's happened in the UK. Um, and I, I, I know less about developing countries or at least all the different possibilities that might, there might be in different regions. Um, but for example, um, when Tony Blair was Prime Minister of the UK, um, he had a vision that 50% of young people, I think it was 18 to 30, would have a university education. So he was setting targets for the UK. Um, and that was reached um, in, uh, in 2020, interestingly. That was finally reached in 2020. Um, and I thought, oh, you know, the pandemic with the experience that the students have had is going to put them off. But in fact, this year, um, applications have been even higher. So, I mean, whether it's success breeds success, I know it's a very complex adaptive system. Um, but actually, this was even in a situation where the availability of students of that age group were dropping. So it is actually, um, there, it is possible to put a rolling stone on this, um, but your vision is global, of course. Um, but I think, yes, absolutely, you know, we should have that vision. And in a way, the pandemic has also, like it's thrown so many things to us. In the UK, it's also thrown to us um, the fact that they, the last two years, in last year and this year, um, there have not been end of school compulsory exams, what we call GCSEs at 16 and A-levels at 18, different countries have different names for them. Um, but these have been based on coursework and teacher opinions. So it's gonna be extremely interesting to see over the next few years, whether that makes any difference um, and what students needs are gonna be you know, to be different. So it is kind of challenging in probably for the first time, well, in our living history, the idea of the university entrance test. So uh, Chris and uh, Jilly, I, I, I want to follow up. This is an interesting conversation to have. So um, I want to invite you to Rene to be the alchemist, to remake uh, <laughs> our education. If you look today, it sounds like every education system has a system. So we have elementary education, middle school, high school, four years of college. Of course, in England, sometimes you do three years, you do two years, you do 16. So this definition even of tertiary education, higher education, it doesn't really make sense, right? And, but, but we made it. So every education system created something. I'm sure it's pretty artificially. It was not based on science. Like we need to do 13 years of uh, so-called secondary school. And then you go three years in college. Uh, it was not scientific, but we create some degree to say, okay, yeah, four years at Harvard or Indiana, then you get a degree. I, I don't think there's a specific said, okay, in this four years, this knowledge quantifies you as a bachelor's degree. You know, the, 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 but globally, it, it didn't make sense, right? So it's different countries have different practices, at least to show it's very artificial what we make. So I was wondering, could we, I just finished a book. I was trying to make this argument. It's called Learners Without Borders. That if, wow. you're not boarded, <laughs> if you're not boarded by, I, I mean, the borders really like uh, education system creates borders, right? And so you have to finish so many years before you go to university, unless you're extremely creative or unless you have extremely powerful parents, right? They send you <laughs> to, so the, 
I was just wondering in the future, do you think given what we have with technology, given that we have access to different universities, different programs, could one student, can that student take whatever course anywhere that person wants and just to demonstrate he's competent in certain things for employment, but really without going through elementary or primary or middle. I was just wondering, do you see that happening? And I know Harvard, you have extensions, right? Chris, you guys have offered some of those things, but really can a student be driving his or her own education? Absolutely, if they knew how to do the driving. I mean, I think there are people, I mean, who are doing that. Um, but it, it, it is a new meaning, isn't it, for lifelong learning rather than the old idea. And, and there's no doubt that we're going to need that. I mean, you've got all this evidence that people are living longer, retiring later. Um, certainly, you know, I, I keep saying to the people that I'm doing learning design with, you know, don't design for the next few years. Some of the people you're designing to teach, they're still going to be working in 50 years time and they will have had, you know, six different careers by then um, so there's absolutely no doubt and let me tell you a little story um, during the pandemic I mean we were in lockdown here in London for a very very long time the schools were closed everything was closed it wasn't just the university and one of my daughters has uh, two girls for age four and eight during the pandemic um, and both she and her husband were working from home and of course it was chaotic to address their education the school took a while before it worked out what it was doing. It was sending out a curriculum, but obviously nobody really knew how to do that. And, and we offered some help. Um, we couldn't meet with the children. Um, so we um, decided to, to do, you know, have a go and see what we could do with Zoom. Um, and my eight-year-old um, granddaughter, she, you know, she looks a bit like me, similar colouring. She goes around with sparkly things in her hair, being a princess and all that sort of thing. And I thought, I wonder what I could do. So it was a pure experimental situation. I decided I would try and turn her into a scientist. Um, I had what, about one to one and a half hours a day with her on Zoom only. Um, so the kind of things we were doing was... Um, you know, asking her questions about why bridges stood up, all sorts of things. Um, you know, getting her to ask good questions and then explore the answers. Um, and I also taught her the periodic table. Um, learned it myself or relearned it myself at the same time. Just using flashcards and uh, sent around some post-it stickers for her to put around the house to identify the various elements and so on. Anyway, it's her ninth birthday um, in a month and she, she has announced she's going to be a paleontologist. So I'm thinking that I might have been successful um, in changing her from a princess to a paleontologist, who knows? But I mean, people like her are going to live very long lives and going to want everything that all of you can offer, me, you, everyone else, and all those that follow behind us. Um, and we, you're absolutely right. We should be designing for this. It's a systems thing, isn't it? It's not, should we have a bit of this technology or should we have that? It's a whole design in the future um, to make that kind of vision possible. Um, and I'm absolutely certain that, that my granddaughter is going to contribute to that as a result of the needs must uh, of the teaching she got from me during the pandemic. Um, Jilly, you have a video that's re recently come out um, that's education post-pandemic. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you say educational alchemy, time to restore, adapt, evolve, or transform, you know, in, in there. So you, you've alluded to it in answering Young's question, but you didn't fully explain the four options that are in front oh, of us. Oh, okay. Do you like right. to go into it? Yeah, now? sure. You're interested in alternative futures. Well, as you know, and as um, we were talking earlier, um, mostly every, all of us look pretty silly if we predict the future, um, but I'm certainly towards the end of my career and I don't mind doing that at all. 
Um, and the reality is that unless you give some a, a clear vision, a design brief, if you like, um, for someone to aim to, then anyway, we'll do. And the outcome is much more random. Anyway, it makes us feel better if we think we're in control. So we're shooting for something. And so I've delivered this video and also quite a few keynote speeches about it, and then had the audience work with which of these things they thought would happen. So I think that's what you're referring to, Kurt. So I think there's four main scenarios, if you like, four main ways of thinking about this. Um, and first, do we really want to restore everything or almost everything? Um, and I have to tell you that it varies a bit on the polls on this, but I often get as many as 10% of a higher education audience that really does want to restore everything um, and to focus on figuring out how to get back to where we were before the pandemic, taking deep breaths and saying, we were fine, you know, don't fix what's not broken. Um, oh, I, I sound a bit overly British, don't I, in that? But, um, it, you know, I mean, for me, is this really a flexible way forward or is it just a comfortable way back? possibly a comfortable way back to oblivion for all we know. Um, but I'll leave you to make your mind up on that. Um, next one uh, I talk about is adapt. Um, and a lot of people think, oh yeah, because the external environment has changed so much. I mean, uh, you know, sort of Time Magazine is saying every company is a tech company now you know, both commercial and public, that we're all tech companies now. We don't just rely on a few tech companies. It's at the core of everything we do. However, they're saying, okay, we'll adapt to this. There'll be some kind of new normal and we, we probably will need to make some quite serious adjustments in our learning and working practices. And I suppose what they're doing is kind of rolling with the punches um, um, making sure they're still around doing the good things that they've previously valued, but perhaps, you know, doing some things a little differently. And we generally get, you know, 20 to 30% of my audience that says, yeah, they think that's what they're doing. I mean, I just don't get it myself um, because, you know, they're putting so much effort into that adaption rather than revisioning uh, taking this opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity, but again, that's my opinion. So there's the four, the third one is what I call evolve. Um, and this is where we invite people to take thoughts on the huge disruption to consider constructing some new ways. Maybe some of those ideas we had before the pandemic that were slow to achieve or difficult to achieve, um, I mean, we know that evolution means survival of the fittest, and but this does leave some people behind. Um, a lot of people are talking about quite gradual evolving of something in response to environmental forces. Um, but you've got to survive long enough, you know, um, to, to emerge triumphant and resilient. And I, I don't see that amount of resilience around, but evolving is another option. And the fourth, of course, is transform or reform. Um, and this means we put our thinking on redefining some of our core activities um, and offerings, you know, taking an active role in creating the innovative new future of higher education and boldly contributing, if you like, to the way that the, the sector goes and it, investing all our effort into reshaping student experiences. All of you have been talking about that, really, I think. Um, and this means a complete change in form or character. Um, I think COVID-19 thrusts upon us the need for this route, you know, to go forward. Um, and to make us fit for purpose, really, when the next global event threatens. Um, and that, it, to me, is in a nutshell, is piloting towards a much more sustainable future for universities. Um, and I regret to say only about 10% of my audience choose that one. Um, the rest is sort of spread around the rest. 
So, but 10% is probably enough, actually. You know, 10% on serious innovation, especially um, if we all got together, <laughs> um, you know, and, and created a multiplier effect. As you can see, I'm quite passionate about this. Yes, I mean, I'm thinking <laughs> that too. We had 67 shows and we've had, you know, probably 100 folks or more, 150, who are making a major difference in terms of the thinking around um, educational models and practices. And we could get all those people together for an institute or, you know, a, a global virtual institute or some kind of online book uh, that we could set out some principles you know, common principles, you know, get just getting started. Manifesto, uh, not, manifesto coming up, Kurt. Well, yeah, one of my doc <laughs> students defended last week and she had a manifesto at the end of it, believe wow. it or not. She was pretty bold for, a, you know, a doctoral student putting forth their manifesto on how Turkish education needs to change or educational tech. Um, anyways, Chris has a follow-up and then I have one. So Chris, jump in here or comment, I think. So this show has really been about a kind of a paradox that a really disruptive event opened up opportunities for transformation, something that was a step backward enabled at least the chance for a step forward. And when you, when you were talking about technology, I was thinking about that as well. Um, let's take um, Zoom and, and other forms of video conferencing. Um, people have said correctly that had this pandemic happened two decades ago, before we had cell phones, before we had the bandwidth for this kind of video conferencing, it would have been much, much worse, which I think is true. But there's, there's a hidden benefit of video conferencing that hasn't been discussed much. And that is that it's enormously tiring and that um, people talk about Zoom fatigue and, and the fact that really once somebody has been talking for 10 minutes, after that point, all you hear is blah, 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 <laughs> education, blah, 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 <laughs> technology, right? And, and so people have had to flip the classroom, if you will, whether they like it or not, they've had to break things into small chunks, have people watch it in advance. But of course, that's exactly what we needed to do. Because again, looking back when I was growing up, it's access to knowledge that was scarce. But now everybody is, is surrounded by information and even by knowledge. And the challenge is interpretation and application. So in my flipping the classroom, what we spend our interactive time doing is understanding what these presentational knowledge really means and how you apply it in the real world, which is, I think, related to something that you said earlier about the fact that a really good education is not cheap. And it's not cheap not because you can't present knowledge cheaply, but because you can't do the interactive interpretation and application and individual support cheaply, at least not yet. So it, it's ironic that the weakness of the technology may have actually been a bigger benefit than its <laughs> strengths in terms of forcing us into a kind of andragogy that, that is the right thing to be doing. Super positive view, and but I think a lot of people are realizing this. Um, you know, there's still people saying to me, "Well, how do I make them turn their cameras on?" But most of them are recognizing what you're talking about. I think that's why a lot of people have revisited my work because it was always about engagement and uh, peer working, and you know, all the benefits that you know uh, kind of were obvious to us. Uh, working remotely and all the research that went into it but on the other hand people are still saying to me you mean there's journal articles about this you mean there's professors there's books um and and you've been a professor of e-learning you know for 25 years really 
you know, so there's still a lot of people discovering it. So they're doing what you're doing. They're just finding that it is a discipline and there is a body of knowledge that will help you do it better. Um, and that has to be a good thing. So we, I used to do a lot of this copper dim learning design, which is a code design. It used to be very exciting, you know, 50 of us in a room all running around doing storyboards and um, inventing new things and, and planning it all out. So that all that had to go online um, during the pandemic. And we've done more than a hundred of them sort of worldwide since then. But I've realized I always should have done that previously because we we always know that people, you should actually practice what you preach, shouldn't you? And you should, people learn by doing. Um, so sort of professors learn by doing as well. And all teachers at all levels learn by doing. So I don't think I'm going back to the face-to-face -face carpe diem learning design. I think I'm gonna keep it online. For that reason, Young's going to jump in here. Young, yeah, I was just thinking about uh, con coming out, connecting to Chris' comments about uh, Zoom fatigue and online. And uh, so I was, um, I should not say this because it was dangerous if I said this. If we had the pandemic come and go for another five or 10 years, if we simply cannot get back to school, so Julie, I was wondering. What kind of online learning would you consider valuable? What should we change instead of trying to get everybody onto Zoom, you know, like, you know, blah, blah, mm -hmm. talk about this thing. <laughs> so what, what kind of format, what kind of online learning would you endorse? Let's just imagine the pandemic yeah. will disrupt our life for another five or 10 years. Or if you're scaring pandemic, me now, something. you are scaring me now. <laughs> well, it's possible. We said about last year, I know. You don't know. Realistically, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, right, America is so in lockdown again, you know. I had thought about this. I haven't really thought about it. It's still been there in 10 years. But I have thought about, you know, what sort of format does it need to be? Um, I'll tell you the way I think about Zoom and sort of synchronous technologies. I think of face-to-face um, -face and location-based learning as a substitute to Zoom. So it might be Teams or it might be Blackboard Collaborate or all the other things we've got. Obviously, the more functionality you've got, the better. Um, but I, I think of it this way. So I think digital first. Um, and then if we put some synchronous, weaving synchronous events into the story of the pedagogy that we're designing, then if it's possible to go back to campus or to the workplace or to the lab or to do visits, all the other things that uh, depend on being a, in a place and all together, um, then fine, we, we can put that in. But if you tell me you're doing this for the next 10 years, I would have no difficulty in finding a whole range of other ways of doing those synchronous events, but around it would be built all the other things, the, you know, the, the good pedagogy of the timing, of, of gradually building groups working together so they move from being, you know, cooperative to collaborative, to creating knowledge together, that they learn that uh, working online promotes metacognition much more, which will help them in the future if they understand how they're learning as well as what they're learning. So I would exploit all those good things that we know about online learning and just say, sure, if eventually it becomes super safe for you to go and sit in lecture theatres, that'll be your choice. What do you think will happen? They'll say no thanks by then. So I would turn your 10 year pandemic into that kind of advantage. So Julie, you know, I was going to ask you about your latest or one of your latest articles uh, in the Journal of Learning for Development and Education 4.0, but I think I'm going to hold off on that one till later because you're really talking about, in a way, some of, some of your work uh, on e-moderating. And for the audience in, in YouTube, she had a website called All Things in Moderation at one point. I don't know if that website is, is that? It isn't now, no. Oh. <laughs> It's on so, my list. <laughs> okay, it's on your list to do, okay. Yeah. Um, so, but you still, you do have, you have your model up there and you're yeah. pretty well known for this model. But again, yeah. people are discovering you. Many, yeah. 
people, you know, in America maybe haven't reached out and in, 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 in to this model. Could you talk to us about your two books, E-Modering and E-Tivities, and the emphasis on pedagogy and this particular model? What do people yeah. glean from this model? Is it okay. easy to use? Um, are you modifying it in any ways? You know, is it missing anything? Um, okay. Well, it's really interesting. I suppose it would be better if I say I was, but in fact, the book's in third edition. I'm not actually writing too many more books at the moment. I'm focusing on my YouTube channel and blogs and so on because that's quicker and more effective and more accessible for people. So the model actually hasn't changed. That diagram is still there every time uh, I do it. And, and the reason for this, I think, it was while I was at the Open University and I had access to a very large number of remote students. and. And it was before the days, um, really very early days of online networking. And, and the model was developed as a grounded model. In other words, um, it described what people did given the opportunity on a large number. It was over 2000 MBA students over a couple of years. And um, describe what they did. It, um, it, it, it was developed quite a lot at the time. And it described how they went from even gaining access and being motivated to ever to come back all the way through to it being, you know, a, a whole learning environment for them with people that they felt safe and secure and could learn with. And, and there are five steps that goes from access and, and motivation, what I called online socialization, but it's obviously inter often interpreted now as sort of small group working, how to get people to work in small groups. Then the idea of cooperation, where people are still really in pursuit of their own goals, but um, they are prepared to contribute to, you know, to larger groups. And then the true con knowledge construction and collaboration. And we found that you need to go through those stages to get everybody to that point. And then the all importance of looking back to understand you know, the journey you've been on, and that then helps you to look forward. So if the five stage model is built into every year of a student's learning and every course, then you can see them blossom more and more, it increases retention, increases satisfaction, increases achievement. So when I published the first book on it, it was originally to enable tutors, the people I call the e-moderators, to understand this model and therefore support their students better. But interestingly, when I published on it, a lot of people adopt it as a learning design model. So I think it's been fairly crowdsourced, really. I sort of offered the model and then people have done exactly what they wanted with this. Now, eTivities, which was the next one, was a bit different because people were saying, teach us how to do small bits of learning at each stage of the five so that we can get really good engaged learning for the groups that we're working with, the students we're working with in whatever subject at each of the five. And I was lucky I got some research funding and um, you know, sort of was able to use all the literature of the day and my own knowledge as a cognitive psychologist to put into that. Um, and then we published on that framework. And again, that framework, um, has now been adapted for synchronous learning. So people are using it as well. So we've got S-tivities, synchronous activities, as well as E-tivities, which was originally asynchronous. So there's been adaptions over the time, um, but that's, I think, the most popular um, digital workshop I do at the moment. Um, and it seems to work for almost anything from quite young students. I mean, I think the young, youngest probably sort of secondary school age, teenagers, all the way up to someone I'm working with who's, you know, um, doing sort of teaching people to do research for PhD level. So, um, so people just then make their own adaption to it. So that's been quite a joy that, that all that work that went on, you know, quite a long time ago, has really um, become a model that we've got confident in that people can make their own, do the you adaptation know, that, and so on. That goes back to Chris's point that, you know, we're lucky that we've had 20, 25 years of experience, models, frameworks, activities, pedagogies, and research 
And they were able to take some of that. And you use the word adapt at least a couple of times in your answer. We're adapting a lot of what we, we designed earlier. Yeah. And Punya, back in handling the YouTube channel, just jumped in here and he said, you know, ASU, Arizona State students are going to come back, maybe, or they're going to join in synchronously. A couple of months ago, the guest on the show was Brian Beatty, who is from my former student, who's now at San Francisco State, who designed the high flex model. And you may have heard, may or may not, a high flex. And that's basically what Punya is saying. It requires more work on the part of the instructor, especially planning it out, but also more flexibility on the part of instructors in terms of acceptability of the students from where they are. Some weeks they might be face to face, some weeks they decide to come in remotely. And it's, it's a mix of that. So, um, so yeah, he's put that up here. And, um, uh, you know, thinking back 15 years ago with our handbook of blended learning, or, you, you know, adding to it, we, you know, a lot has happened in the blended learning space during the past yeah. 15 yeah. years, especially yes. during the pandemic, and especially coming up, we're going to see blended things that we haven't even utilized previously mm -hmm. are going to come about this coming fall and spring. Mm, that would be great, won't it, really? So... But when you look ahead to the 4.0 stuff, we are needing to develop skills so people can use all of this at work. It's not just about education. I mean, if we want to have the kind of vision that, you know, some of you have been talking about, then we need to make sure that this transfers people for lifelong, you know, workplace. So, I mean, one of the other things I've been doing is... Um, what's called health placements, you know, uh, across allied health, the whole range of physio, nursing, those kinds of things. Um, and I, I right quite early in the pandemic um, in the UK, there was this idea of protecting the National Health Service. So everything went into um, supporting, um, you know, victims of COVID um, and all the educational placements for all those training at degree level, most of it just stopped. And there were students unable to progress from one year to the next. There were students um, unable to complete their degrees and go into practice, despite the fact that was most needed. So we used all of this work to develop an online placement, which is called Peer Enhanced E-Placements, called PEEP, which is on my website if anyone's interested in that work. There's quite a bit on the channel as well. Um, and as we sort of, that's easing a little bit, um, a lot of people are planning to continue doing some of their placements online um, because they realised there were benefits from it. They, they, you know, it's enabled them to see that the peers work together, whereas previously students were going into a hospital working with geriatric patients all of whom had hip placements and they didn't see another student in that time to discuss what was going on whereas now they're working on these cases very very actively and their clinical reasoning with the research we're doing also appears to have improved because they're hearing what other people are doing they're getting more rapid feedback than they would um, in a hospital or clinic environment. So there's all sorts of benefits that we can make sure that we hang on to and sustain in that way. And um, that's a new form of blend, isn't it, Kurt, really? It, there's all sorts of new forms. Mm. Chris has got a comment that I want to get to Education 4.0. Chris. <laughs> so my late colleague, Clayton Christensen, talked mm. about disruptive innovation and you see a lot of this in industry mm. and technology. Mm. You know, the, the mainframes were disrupted by the mid range. We were disrupted by the desktop, were disrupted by the laptop, and now they're disrupted by tablets and cell phones. And, and part, one of the keys to disruptive innovation is being possible is that it's a consumer market. And he mistakenly attempted to apply his model to K-12 education, and he didn't understand, and we had some debates about this, he and I, that that isn't a consumer market. People are locked in, they pay taxes, and then they get what they get. Um, but higher education now is very much a consumer market. Mm -hmm. Geographic monopolies have disappeared. Uh, we're seeing mega universities that can really deliver uh, very large student bodies. 
And I think it's ripe for disruptive innovation. I have a lot of hope about your stage four because <laughs> I think it takes just one really good model and, and lots of people flocking into it and and there go the mainframe computers. You know, they're now now everybody has to change or 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 be a dinosaur. And oh, Chris, have you got that model for us today? I I I think that there's many pieces of that model, but nobody has quite put it together. <laughs> but but the point is that that the time is right. You can't say the same thing about K to 12 education, but you can say that about right. higher education. Hmm. Okay. Now, now, Kurt, before you jump in, I, I just have a, a, a comment. Again, uh, it has a lot to do with the, um, who drives, because I'm really deeply worried about educational equity. Uh, but I, if you look at the equity uh, efforts by a lot of people, I think many times, you know, in my not so happy moment, we're depriving the poor children, disadvantaged disadvantaged children of the rights to a real education. So many ways, so, so if unless these children can gain their right and they can have access to a lot of resources, uh, you know, uh, what, what Chris was talking the manufacturer scarcity. I think we have a manufacturer scarcity. We pretend that children cannot do this. They have to do that, you know. I think, you know, unless we create such a broad set of references uh, or resources and give, you know, the access to these children, I don't think we can really achieve equity. I, I know I understand, Jile, as you were saying, uh, good education cannot be cheap. But I was wondering, so here's, I want to invite you to think about, can we get not so good education, but at least a better education than their classroom <laughs> education? Because I've seen too many classrooms are horrible places, you know? Uh, so especially if you are in remote villages, all those places. Right. I was just wondering about your, your comments about not so good education, but slightly cheaper. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm sure we could. So we need to work on two models then, don't we? <laughs> At least, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think the reason it's so expensive is that we're doing it within the existing system. So I, I think, as you've suggested, we need to disrupt the system um, in order to make it more scalable, you know. So, I mean, people have managed to do this with so many other products, haven't they? Food, cars, you know. So it can't be beyond us to take those models and trial them for good enough scalability for education. So yeah, I'm because green. I was just uh, thinking that uh, you, you made some good examples, you know. In food, in cars, we have so many different levels. I, but in education, whenever we talk about, we talk about there's one version of education, unless it's the best for everybody, it cannot happen, you know? So that we have this very homogeneous view, but we also know what's good for one person may not be good for another person. So that's another thing about, about design. So this is a, it's a quite fascinating conversation, but thank you for, for coming to talk about this. <laughs> I know Kurt wants to jump onto Education 4.0, so I don't want to drag along the, this, this okay. conversation. Thank you. We'll talk some more. Well, in, in the blog post, I, I do recommend the audience to take a look at the blog post. There are 10 links within it, including the video we talked about earlier with the four options, including Education Al Alchemist, where Jilly currently houses or puts up a shingle, uh, and including an article that's in the Journal of Learning for Development. Now, the Journal of Learning for Development comes from the Commonwealth of Learning, and our friend Sanjaya Mishra, who is on show number three of Silver Lining for Learning. Uh, and so I, I assume you know Sanjaya, a great, great um, researcher in the openness space. Um, you had the fort good fortune of being asked, maybe, or thinking about um, the future of education and writing a piece in there in 2019. And of course, at that time, many people were talking about the fourth industrial age and asking others to talk about how education is then mapping onto that. 
And I know every time I'm asked to go to Thailand, I'm asked to talk about a higher level of education. First it's education 3.0 and then 4.0. And my friends tell me they're still in 2.0. So why, you know, but um, you know, you, in that article, you talk about the web 4.0 and moving from the, the first receptive learning 1.0 web, the, the, the bucket of portal of stuff to 2.0 where we can put stuff in it and add to it and interact around it to 3.0 where it becomes our digital lives, our mobile lives. Uh, and we are, you know, digital students where digital, physical and digital world equally uh, an option. And to the fourth, where I think you call a symbiotic relationship between AI intelligence, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. You've read it, Kurt. I, I, I have. Really read in it. fact, <laughs> I'm writing a chapter and I'm citing it in my, oh. my book, the closing chapter of my current book project. Good summary. So, so uh, you are you are in the right, and there's not many references, but you talk about four, same four um, generations. I don't know what we call them, generations, phases, okay. uh, levels. What, I think generations. Can you talk to us about those four generations of education? Yes, I mean, if you have a look at, um, you know, the industrial revolutions, there's a lag, but generally speaking, you know, the, the whole idea of employability is, has been responsive to that. Um, and you can kind of see as you go through that um, education has responded to the industrial revolutions. When you come up to where the web starts to be a thing as part of something that we can deploy, um, then you can start to see the, the influences coming in. Certainly in the UK um, and many other areas, um, you can see that around the time that the web came about, there was a huge amount of this volume, this, this idea that, you know, 50% of the students in the UK were going to go to university, of young people were going to go to university. And that meant that there was a huge opening up um, and they had to start using the technologies of the day um, in order to make that possible, particularly on assessment and so on. Um, and then essentially, I mean, throughout the whole time when we got our first iPods, our host mobile devices and so on, uh, it was at the time I was at the University of Leicester um, and we were really, we really believed that education was going to be fully mobile from that time onwards. Um, I, you know, I, I've been kind of disappointed that that hasn't really happened because I saw it very much as, you know, we would have our universities in our pocket. Sure, there might still be some physical universities around, um, but they would kind of be the brand, the sort of making meaning, if you like. Um, but we would carry with us our university to interact with others, to interact with resources, to interact with our teachers and our leaders. I haven't seen that happening. I don't know whether that might help with the idea of the global fully accessible university, maybe. Um, but then when you start looking ahead to sort of beyond that to education for uh, 4.0, we really this cell symbiotic idea. Um, one, yeah, one direction is that we're going to be sending people out into work um, where they're going to be interacting with, take robotics as the broad area, just as much as they are, you know, with other humans. And, you know, how are they going to be prepared to do that? Or are they just going to watch the science fiction and be terrified by it? Um, you know, and science fiction does give us clues, you know, of what we should be addressing. And very, very few people are now tackling this. Um, and it almost certainly needs symbiosis between disciplines. I know we've always talked for years about how we need interdisciplinary education, how there's some core skills like creativity and innovation that all students should leave innovation, but nobody has really, really done it. Um, but I think 4.0 is definitely going to bring this in. So recently I'm visiting professor at the University of Law, which is sort of UK, London based, um, and the major cities throughout the UK. Um, and for example, 
um, it, we're not talking about, you know, uh, they're starting off by having policing courses, uh, criminology courses, business courses, so that all lawyers have got a greater understanding. But also you need to branch out beyond that because law now also means what's happening in space. Um, the fact that, you know, everyone's overflowing, overflying everybody else's um, land and so on. And so we need to have this much stronger vision of this interconnectivity, symbiosis between disciplines, professions, and also um, between, you know, robotics. And you could do the same if you look at health services. You could do the same if you look at engineering, for example, and that sort of impact. Uh, that's, so, that's probably a good way to end us, uh, <laughs> that vision, that big picture. Uh, we are, I really wanted to continue this conversation as I wanted to find out what it was like being a futures professor or working in the Digital Futures Institute in Australia. I also wanted to find out what a pro vice chancellor does <laughs> and whether a pro vice chancellor, we haven't even gotten to Jilly's past in uh, in Australia, where she spent a lot of time as in charge of the university, mapping out the future there. Uh, so you've had a rich uh, and successful career and still going. And we've been fortunate to have you come in today to share with us a piece of that. I really encourage you all, anyone watching this, to reach out to Jilly. I put her email in there. I hope she doesn't mind. That's okay. <laughs> it's, it's in the blog post. And so write to Jilly. Ask her some questions. See what you can do in your environments and how you can adapt some of her work, whereas the frameworks or activities or other or, or, or education 4.0 model in your thinking, your strategic planning, where you're going in the future. I'm sure she'd be happy to give you some advice and suggestions. And, I to learn, and to learn from you too, as I have today. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, I, we all learn from each other. Uh, and that's what's great about the field of education because uh, people reach out. And we're going to reach out into five time zones next week. We're going to talk to people who created the Edu uh, Horizons Report from EDUCAUSE, Horizons okay. Report uh, 2021. And the last two years in the Horizons Report, they've had implications essays. And there are five implication essays in the middle of the Horizons report. If you go to the blog post for this coming week, you can download the report. I've got a link in there uh, and we'll post it after the show, probably within an hour or two, it will be up. Three of the five authors of those implication essays will be joining us next week from South Africa. We'll have Laura uh, Sesnuiski, I can't say that right, uh, from Cape Town, University of Cape Town. Um, we have John Mason from Charles Darwin University in Australia, and we have a, my friend Araz Baskert from Anadolu University, a distance uh, learning university in Turkey. They'll be bringing in their particular pieces to this show and talking about that and what's happening in Turkey, South Africa, and Australia. It'll start at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so we can get everybody in here. It'll be early in the morning for young, 8 a.m. in the west coast of the U.S. and 12.30 in the morning in, in Darwin. So come join us for the next show. It'll be a lot of fun.